Hello, everybody. My name is Brianna Russell from the Bozeman Public Library. If you've been listening, Carmen is also here. She's the head of our adult programming and outreach. And we are so excited tonight to present to you Connecting with Our Spooky Side with Mo Reynolds. And she is here tonight, and we're going to get to hear a performance from her. Um, she has some plans for us to have an interactive component afterwards. So be ready to share some thoughts in the chat, and she'll explain it a bit more to you as we go. So welcome, 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 Mo. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. Um, technology has been really a, a fantastic thing with, with storytelling. And we've lived in Montana for about five years. And in, because we're up in your Eureka, getting around to live shows has been difficult. Um, I just got connected with Humanities Montana. So I want to make sure to give them a shout out here because we're so grateful for Humanities Montana that makes these things possible. Um, and so when the pandemic hit and everything kind of shut down, um, suddenly the storytelling world just sort of exploded into the virtual scene. And it's been really fabulous to still be able to bring storytelling to these modern day campfires around the country and even around the world as people can tune in um, wherever they might be. So thank you to the Bozeman Library for um, making this happen. And I'm so excited to, to share with you a story. And Carmen reached out to me. And, you know, a lot of times we limit spooky stories to Halloween, but she wanted to sort of extend it into November. And I think that that's really interesting to do um, because sometimes there's there are times when spooky stories are really awesome at Halloween, but there's also, it's fun to be scared year round and to ask ourselves why we like being scared is an interesting question. So there were three very good friends, a farmer, a miller, and a blacksmith. And most nights they would find themselves sitting around the table at the farmer's house, swapping stories, smoking cigars, drinking whiskey. And on this particular night where a story begins, they were exceptionally thirsty. The blacksmith sighed as he looked at his glass and the last few drops of amber liquid swirled inside. He glugged them down, put the glass on the table and stood up to leave. The farmer grabbed him by his elbow and said, where are you going? The night is young. The blacksmith laughed and said, it's midnight. The night is not young and you are out of whiskey. The farmer smiled. I have another bottle in the cellar. I'll send my daughter Mary downstairs, no problem. And he called up the stairs for Mary to come down out of bed. Well, the miller looked at the farmer and said, Mary, your daughter, she's not gonna go down to the cellar at midnight. It's full of bugs and snakes and darkness. And the farmer smiled and said, you don't know my Mary. Nothing scares Mary. She's braver than any of my boys. And suddenly there was Mary standing at his elbow. He turned to her and said, Mary, would you please go down and fetch us another bottle of whiskey from the cellar? She sighed, rolled her eyes perhaps just a little, picked up the lantern and headed down the stairs. In just a few moments, she was back with the lantern, bottle of whiskey. She placed them both on the table. No muss, no fuss, no trembling. She said, good night and headed back upstairs to bed. The blacksmith followed her up the stairs with his eyes, and then he looked back at the farmer. She really isn't scared of anything. No, said the farmer, nothing scares my Mary. In fact, I would bet good money that nobody could scare Mary. The blacksmith leaned back in his chair and he put his hands in his pockets and he pulled out a shiny gold guinea. Would you be willing to bet one gold guinea that I couldn't scare your Mary? The farmer looked at the gold piece, but all he saw were all the things he could buy with it. He poked the blacksmith in the chest. You can't touch her. You can't hurt her. The blacksmith nodded. Yes, of course, of course. The farmer relaxed and stuck out his hand and smiled. It's a deal. When I was 16 or 17 years old, 
I was in the car with my good friend, Heather Brown. We were driving back home from a big day on the town in the big city, a couple of hours away from home. It was a late night and I was tired and Heather had one job. I told her she needed to keep me awake. And she fulfilled that obligation by telling me scary stories. Not creepy, spine tingly folk tale stories, but bloody murdering stories, hooks hanging by car door stories, messages written in blood on dorm room mirror stories. It worked. I was wide awake and I was terrified. I dropped my friend Heather off at her house and I said, Heather, I am seriously freaked out. Will you please go in and call my parents? This is pre-cell phone days. Call my parents and tell them to leave every light on in the house and the front door open because I am so scared. She smiled at me and said, it's a deal. The blacksmith and the miller had to work the next day and so didn't want to stay too late. After another couple of glasses of whiskey, they were on their way and talking about how they would frighten Mary. The miller thought they should jump out from behind the bushes or drop down out of a tree, but the blacksmith shook his head, oh no, no. This girl is something special. We're gonna have to think big. And the miller hesitated. He wondered if this was such a good idea to frighten a young girl. The blacksmith answered, hey, if you're too scared, I'm happy to keep that gold guinea for myself. And the miller decided, yeah, that's for the best. He was out and he left the blacksmith and headed to his house. The blacksmith continued on and by the time he got to his own door, he had a plan. As for me, I also had a plan, and that plan was to get home as quickly as possible. I had a white knuckle grip on my steering wheel, releasing my right hand only occasionally to swipe in my back seat to make sure that no murderers had crept in while I was driving. I continued to drive, and then I saw my gas light turn on. Well, the last thing I needed was to be stranded on the side of the road without gas where any murderer could come along and have their way with me. I had to stop and get gas. I pulled into the gas station. I opened my door and I took a very long step to get out of the car in case any murderer was hiding under the undercarriage of my car, I wanted to make sure my step was long enough so he would not be able to slice my Achilles heel because that's what murderers do when they hide under cars. I put exactly $2 of gas into my gas tank, just enough to get home. I checked the trunk to make sure no murderers had climbed in and I walked around to make sure no bloody hooks were hanging on any of the car door handles. I was clear. I got back in the car, swiped the back seat, and I was on my way. In the morning, the blacksmith was on his way. His plan was perfect. His first stop was the church, and there at the church, he found the sexton. Now, the sexton wasn't the official leader of the congregation. He was simply a neighborly sort of fellow who helped out here and there and cleaned the church and, and got some extra change once in a while for his services. And there he was sweeping out the church. Well, the blacksmith came in and the sexton greeted him. How can I help you, sir? And the blacksmith said, well, I could use a favor. Tonight, I just need you to be somewhere tonight at midnight or a little before midnight. And the sexton stopped sweeping and looked at the blacksmith and said, where do you need me to be at midnight? Oh, just the dead house, answered the blacksmith. The dead house is a small home next to a cemetery. And these exist in the Eastern parts of the United States. In the olden days when the ground was too hard and they wouldn't be able to bury a body, they would simply stack them up in these dead houses to wait for the spring thaw. But sometimes the thaw would come 
and the money would not be there. And so the bodies would stay in the dead house for various amounts of time. As you can imagine, it's nowhere you would want to be at midnight. And the sexton made sure the blacksmith knew that. No way, he said. I am not going to be in the dead house at midnight. The blacksmith reached into his pocket again and brought out that shiny gold guinea. Well, sir, would you do it for half of this gold guinea? The sexton looked at that gold guinea, but all he saw were the things he could buy with it. Okay, he agreed. I will be at the dead house at midnight. Excellent, said the blacksmith, and he was on his way to work. He worked all day and then the nighttime came and there they were gathered at the table again. The farmer, the miller, and the blacksmith, where the blacksmith explained his plan. All she has to do, he said, is go to the dead house at midnight and bring us back one skull. The farmer couldn't believe it. The dead house at midnight? And he was about to say no when he thought of the holes in his shoes and the holes in his roof. And he agreed, and he called for Mary to come downstairs. He explained to Mary what she needed to do, and she gave him a very curious look. Then she picked up the lantern, looked at the clock, for it was almost midnight, and then she was on her way. I lived on an old tobacco farm in the middle of nowhere, North Carolina. And when I pulled into my driveway and could see every light burning in my house, I thanked the heavens for my wonderful friend, Heather, and my loving parents. I drove up the driveway, checking every window, every window. And then I pulled into the parking area and I still had a bit of a walk from my car to the front door. So I took my keys and I put a key between each finger. So I was like a Wolverine. Then I could punch and stab at the same time. Then I took a deep breath and waited. Mary could not wait forever outside the dead house. She knew she had to go in. So she took a deep breath and pushed open the door. It was the smell, the smell that overpowered her. It wasn't the smell of death and decay. The bodies were too frozen to rot. No, it was the smell of life. It was the smell of the snakes and the mice and the rats and the birds, the life that was feasting on the death inside. She took one step in and looked to the right where all of the women's bodies were stacked in various levels of decay. There was a skull close to her foot. And so she leaned over. But as soon as she touched it, the air was filled with a scream. No! That's my mother! She dropped it. The men were stacked on the left side. And so she took a step and she leaned over to pick up the skull, skull closest to her on that side. No! The air was filled again. That's my father! So she turned around again and she picked up a skull on the woman's side and a snake slithered out the eye hole over her thumb. But before the scream could begin, she stood up and shouted, I don't care if this is your wife, your mother, your cousin, or your very best friend. I'm taking it and I'm leaving. And she wheeled around and marched out the door, slamming it behind her and locking it from the outside. I sat in my car 
and I looked all around. Then I opened my door and began walking up. I saw movement out of my right eye and then he was on me. He was just barely taller than I and he was dressed in black from head to foot and his arms wrapped around me like a vice. And I began to punch and scream and stab and claw with everything I had. But Mary, she didn't scream or punch or tremble. She simply straightened her shoulders and walked home. In a few moments, she was standing at the table again. She put the lantern down and then the skull. And without a word, she turned and headed upstairs. The blacksmith leapt to his feet and he grabbed her by the hand. Wait, wait. Well, didn't you, didn't you see anything? Yes, she answered. I saw piles of dead bodies. Well, well, did you hear anything? Yes, she answered. Someone tried to stop me from taking the skull. And they were quite upset because when I left, they were howling and banging and kicking and making quite a fuss. Then she smiled and said, good night. And turned and went upstairs without another word. The blacksmith looked at the miller. The miller looked at the blacksmith, but the farmer only had eyes for his brand new gold guinea. He was looking at it with such love that he didn't even notice the miller and the blacksmith running out the door. They ran to the dead house and the blacksmith threw himself against the door again and again and again until the miller, who perhaps at this moment had a slightly cooler head, stopped him and simply unlatched the lock. They pushed open the door and hit something heavy and hard on the ground. They lowered their lantern light and there they saw him. The sexton, a look of terror frozen on his lifeless face. He would not be leaving the dead house for a very, very long time. I did not die. I continued to punch and scream and kick and I felt one arm release me and I, I saw him pull his face off, his mask off of his face with a flash and then I heard a familiar voice, Morgan, Morgan, it's me, Morgan, it's me, it's your dad, honey, it's me, it's dad, it's dad, stop. I did not stop. In fact, I punched harder. And I screamed, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. And I ran inside to my mother. My father watched me run off with the thought in his mind, probably along the lines of something like, wow, I really miscalculated that situation. The blacksmith and the miller and the farmer also worried that they had miscalculated that situation. The miller, who really had nothing to do with the sexton's death, was haunted by that face. The blacksmith, who had everything to do with the sexton's death, was haunted by that face and began to imagine tools moving on their own and strange things happening in his shop, but no one was as worried as the farmer. He worried about the sexton. He worried about what he had done to his daughter. He worried so much that he kept that gold guinea with him all the time. He wouldn't take it to the bank. He wouldn't spend it. He would just rub it between his fingers or keep it in his pocket. He slept with it. He never ever let it go. One morning, 
he awoke to a sound he had not heard in many, many years. Creak, creak, creak. He opened his eyes and the rocking chair was rocking. The rocking chair his wife had sat in for years until she had died five years earlier. And it was rocking as if she had just gotten up. He jumped out of bed and he stilled it with his hands. He ran downstairs past Mary who was making breakfast. He looked around at the yard and then he shook his head, convinced he had made it up and he went to work. That night he was a little nervous to go to sleep, afraid of what he would hear in the morning. And sure enough, there it was. Creak, creak, creak. He opened his eyes and there was the rocking chair. But now on each arm was a red glove, his wife's red gloves. He jumped out of bed and he ran down past Mary who was making breakfast again and he ran into the barn and he looked up in the barn and down in the barn and then he ran back upstairs to his room, but the gloves were gone. He shook his head and he went to work again and he worked very, very hard all day to make himself so exhausted he could sleep soundly. And he did until the sound came. Creak, creak, creak. And he cracked open his eyes and there was the chair and there were the gloves. And now there was a hat perched on the back of the chair his wife's hat and his wife's red shawl was wrapped around the chair as if the chair had caught a chill during the night. He jumped out of bed and he ran down the stairs, Mary! And she turned around with a spoon in her hand, a curious look, yes, father? Never mind, never mind. And he went to work without bothering to return to the room. And he worked even harder that day. And he went without supper. And he worked and he worked and he worked until he could barely keep his eyes open. And then he collapsed into bed without even changing. And in the morning, creak, creak, creak. And he opened his eyes. And there was the chair and there was the hat and there was the shawl. But now there was a pair of boots on the floor and a red dress draped over the rocking chair. This was too much. He threw back the covers, he jumped out of bed and he opened his window and then he picked up everything and he threw out the hat and he threw out the shawl and he threw out the gloves and he threw out the boots and then he threw out the red dress and as it floated softly down, he picked up the entire chair and he launched it out of his window. And it fell to the ground and cracked into four pieces. There, he shouted and slammed the window closed. Then he went out past Mary who gave him another curious look to his chores where he worked happily all day. And that night he went to bed knowing the sound would not return. Creak, creak, creak. He shook his head, but there was another sound. A whisper, whispering, whispering, whispering. And he opened his eyes and there was the chair and there were the boots and there was the dress, but it was not empty. There was his wife sitting in her chair, her hat on her head, bowed down looking at her hands folded in her lap as she was whispering, whispering. And the farmer sat up and he leaned forward. What? What are you saying? My father came upstairs to my room I heard him knock on my door. I heard him say, Morgan, Morgan, it's dad. I heard the apology in his voice, but I would not listen. 
I grabbed a piece of paper and a pen and I wrote him a message. I folded the paper twice and I slid it under the door. I heard him sigh as he bent over to pick it up. The farmer leaned forward. I can't hear you. My love, what are you saying? My father unfolded the paper once. Whispering, whispering. The farmer stood up and took a step towards his wife. What is it? What are you saying? My father unfolded the paper twice. The farmer took another step towards the chair. I can't hear you. What? What are you saying? And she grabbed him by the wrist and held on so fiercely that he dropped the gold guinea into her lap. And then she pulled him down until the brim of her hat rubbed her him on the cheek. And my father read the words that she whispered in his ear. Fathers should not scare their daughters. The end. All right. The, one of the hardest things about online is that I can't um, tell if anyone's clapping <laughs> or anything. <laughs> it's so hard, but that's okay. So um, we have a few participants here. That's awesome. Um, what we're going to do is kind of have a discussion. So in a webinar, um, the nice thing about a webinar is you get to just relax and you can be in your pajamas or doing whatever, um, just watching and enjoying. But we are going to try to have a little bit of a discussion here. And if you look on your screen, there's a Q&A box. Um, and it looks like a little kind of a series of folder here. Um, that says Q and A. So we're gonna use this as kind of a discussion board um, and to talk a little bit about storytelling. Let me take a swig of water here. Um, about storytelling, why we tell stories and, um, and then sort of maybe play around with our own stories a bit and, and what kind of connections we can make as we learn our own stories and, and see how they fit in with with stories that we may already know. So first I wanna just have a general discussion. So hopefully you can open up that Q&A and you'll just type it in as a question, but this is just gonna be kind of a discussion chat room sort of thing. So I wanna ask you this question and I'd love it if you could answer. Um, why do you think storytelling exists? Think of all the different, you know, as long as there have been campfires and fishing trips, there have been stories. Right, people have told stories, real stories, folk stories, kind of in the middle, maybe a little bit true stories, maybe made up stories. Um, and I just wanted to ask you, you, know, you came, those of you who came, and Carmen, who invited me to come and everyone who's here, why do you think storytelling exists? Why do you think people tell stories? So if you can type any answers or thoughts into the Q&A. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Okay, so oh, there's this. So to entertain or to tell a moral, to create and preserve community. And that community one is so huge. For me as a storyteller, a, a big, every storyteller has different purposes and there are so many different, oh, <laughs> there's the fire alarm going off in my house. <laughs> That's the joy of live TV. My guess is <laughs> my kids probably open the oven when it was too hot. Oh, they got it off. There we go. So, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, that's live for you. So community and to me is a huge part of storytelling and connection. 
Um, that's why I'm a storyteller is I love connection. And this story that I just told you about my dad, um, everything is true about what he did to me, except for the note part at the end that I had to make up in order to merge with the other stories. But, um, and it's interesting to me now because my dad has dementia and of course doesn't remember that or anything <laughs> at all. Um, and those stories in a community disappear unless they're told, right? So when people die, their stories die with them unless we have drawn those stories out of them and out of each other. So building community is a really valuable part of storytelling. Um, and I paired those two stories together because they are about fathers and daughters. That original folktale is an old English folktale and it's a totally different um, in the original form. Mary is very brave. Her dad makes the bet. She goes and gets the skull um, and she gets this reputation for being super brave. And then the squire of the land invites her to come live with him because he's bothered by the ghost of his mother. And then the ghost of his mother is so impressed with how unscarable Mary is that she shows her where this hidden treasure is. And, and it's sort of like, and they all lived happily ever after story. But I heard that story and I read it and I was like, but that dad really freaked his daughter out. Like that's, I couldn't get past that when I read the story. I was like, there's something wrong there. <laughs> and, um, and so that made me think of the story of my father. Um, and then I love to pair stories together of folk tales with my stories, because I think that storytelling tells us about who we are. And when we are willing to see our story in someone else, whether that's a folktale or the human that's right in front of us, then we become better people, right? Because every human has a story. And this is a day and age right now, especially in our country, we have stopped seeing other humans as humans. We just simply see what they are right there in front of us. And we forget that they are layers and layers of story of funny stories and traumatic stories, but there are all these stories there and in their stories are things that are similar to our stories. And when we make those connections, then I think we really can progress. So we're gonna kind of work, do a kind of a activity here. So let me clear these out um, to talk about how we could make some of those interesting connections and just think about things in a different way. So what I'd love for you to do is, if you can start typing in this Q&A box, some folk tales that are really familiar, hundreds of movies have been made about these, just really familiar folk tales. And while you do that, um, Brown is going to read them to me as you type them. Um, and I am going to put them on a master list here. So just start typing in, you know, little old writing head, John, perfect, Johnny Appleseed. So I'll start with that. So Brianna, if you can, all right. Just so have those with me as they type them. Okay. Let's see. Hopefully you can still see it. Can you still see the Q&A if I have this up? Yep, still see okay. it. Okay. All right. So we have Johnny Apple. Oh, wait, here we go. We have Johnny Appleseed. Anybody have any others? That's it so far. That's it so far. Okay. Do you have any? <laughs> you can tell me. What do you think? I don't know if that's how you spell John. Telling well, me this. No, because I'm. Hi, this is Carmen again. Um, hey, Carmen. Yeah, um, because I'm a panelist, I can't type in the Q and A. So I guess I'm just going to. Oh, perfect. I know. I'm like I can't type anything. Um, so um, speaking of scary stories, I and I can't remember what the exact title is, but it's um, in a kids book of scary stories to tell in the dark by Alvin Schwartz and it's that story about this girl with the red handkerchief around her neck and oh I yes the girl I yeah I know that one I remember that one was when I was a kid yeah the girl I heard it's a ribbon or oh, ribbon yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and she uh, told her oh, fiance oh. don't ever take the ribbon off and right, right, right. Yeah. we also and have yeah. Jack and the Beanstalk now up in oh. the chat awesome Okay. How about a Red Riding Hood? Yes. Cinderella. Yes. 
We'll do this one, Hansel and Gretel. That's one that a lot of people know. Oh. I'm having a mental block right now. <laughs> it's funny, as soon as you have to of, think about it, you forget. You think of Cinderella, of uh, Disney movies, that usually. What about Sleeping help. Beauty? Sleeping Beauty, oh yeah, that's a great one. So what is that called when the what you did like merging these two stories is there a name uh -huh. for it or no you know it's something that um i actually i just um, i just um just i was performing at the florida storytelling festival in january of this year and the idea just kind of came to me because there were two i couldn't decide which story i wanted to tell and there were two stories that i felt like had and i was like oh I think I'm going to try, I'm just going to try this to kind of ping pong between these two stories. And so I tried it and, um, and it, and I really love it. And I, there aren't really, at least I haven't, and I listen to a lot of storytellers. I haven't heard any other tellers that do that. So there are a lot of tellers that do. Um, okay. That's our list. I'll go back to the, let's see, here we go. Um, were there any, oh, Rumpelstiltskin. Oh, I didn't see that one. Good. That one just popped up. Thank you. I'll add that to my list real fast. But now I have to, how do you spell that? I don't know. <laughs> From Paul Stilts, uh, Stilts Skin. Oh, that's close enough. Um, anyway, so about the, and it's something that, so there, there are a lot of tellers who only do, storytellers that just do personal narrative. Um, and they just tell stories, real life stories about their lives. And then there are a lot of, there's a kind of a group of storytellers who just do folk and fairy tales. That's their niche, their area of expertise. And then there are some that do um, personal narratives, tall tales, right? Where they tell real stories, but they kind of become liars, competitions kind of thing. But oh. I really just love them to overlap. Yeah. We do have another one in the chat oh, now, Rapunzel. Rapunzel. Good, I'll add that one. All right, so that's great. But um, I just, so this is fairly kind of new for me as a storyteller, this method, but I've just been really enjoying it, taking it to schools and having them do this process as well, because it is a great way to look at critical thinking as you're reading a story or a novel or a book or a play um, to, to see yourself in it. So what we have here is a list of stories. Let's see, did we get everybody? Yeah. I'll dismiss those so we don't cloud it, crowd it out. So let's see here. What I'm going to show you, so we have this list, um, Johnny Appleseed down, the girl with the ribbon. We don't know the official title, but it's this haunting story about the ribbon around her neck. Um, so these are folk and fairy tales that you know pretty well. Okay. So what I'd like you to think about doing right now is look at this list. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ten stories and I want you to pick four or five of them maybe and quickly as maybe jot down if you have a piece of paper or you can jot it down in your phone or something kind of write down what you feel like is a main message of this story okay what is a main message of Little Red Riding Hood or Cinderella so you don't have to do a list of all 10 of them but maybe pick out four or five of them that really stand out to you right away um, and just take a minute, I'll, give, I'll stop talking and let you work, um, but take a minute and write down next to them, jot it down, what is the key message or theme that you feel like this story is trying to teach? So I'll leave this list up and be quiet, give you a minute or so to work on that. I'm going to, sorry, oops, that blocked it for you. I'm going to print this out so I can look at it <laughs> while we're, while we're talking. Uh, 
Okay, so let's kind of talk about this a little bit. So again, in the Q and A, this is a time, um, or or my fellow hosts, also they can just shout it out. Um, but I would like to discuss some of the themes here. So if you could just pick one story, you wrote a few down, um, but maybe just pick one of those to share, write the name of the folk tale and what you think the message is um, that that folk tale is, is, is trying to teach or that fairy tale. What do you think the main theme or messages of that story? If you could just share that, type that up in the Q&A, that'd be awesome. Or fellow hosts, you guys can just say it. <laughs> What's one, one folk or fairy tale and, and what theme do you feel like that it centers on? So Cinderella, I think um, a lot of like family and mm -hmm. um, fathers and daughters. Ha. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, the evil stepmother uh, type. So, yeah, I don't know. Is that what you were looking for? Kind yeah, of? no, exactly. Right. There's not there's not a specific right or wrong. But yeah, so it's a story about family. And yeah. when I've done this exercise, it's always so interesting to me to hear how um, different people hear different stories, because people may be hearing the same words, but they are hearing a different story. Right. So the story that I shared that father, my father daughter experience with my dad scaring me, that could be a trigger that can bring all sorts of different emotions up for different people, depending on their relationship with their fathers, right? Everyone hears a different story, even if they're hearing the same words. And so Cinderella, some people might have, I've heard people say, oh, it's about kindness and it's about compassion. Um, it's not about family at all. And then, but that to you is a family story and which is great, right? Um, so Jack and the Beanstalk, no free lunch, consequences of greed. Good. Um, and again, someone else could read that same story and say, Jack and the Beanstalk, that teaches me about like, you know, go climb the beanstalk, go get what you want. Like that works out great for him. Right. <laughs> so, um, and, and there's no right or wrong to this. Everybody sees a different theme in a different story. So thank you so much um, for sharing that. Anybody else in our Q and A or, uh, or Brianna, do you have a story from that list that you feel like had a, a theme? Sure, I was going to go with Hansel and Gretel, which is also interestingly a story about a weird dysfunctional family. Um, yeah. And I think its main theme, or maybe lesson, is, is the theme of caution and skepticism. Hmm. Um, but I'm thinking about how, you know, the kids try, they leave their little trail of breadcrumbs, and then, you know, the birds, the little creatures get rid of it. Um, so they're trying all along, but huh. the world is is out against them. It's been a while since I've heard that story. So those are the parts I remember. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's great because it's fun to think about a story that you haven't read or listened to in a really long time, because then those salient pieces that you are remembering, that's the key parts of the story that, that matter to you. Those are the ones that stuck in your brain, right? So the fact that you've think about oh, the breadcrumbs and the, then what that means. And, and so it's kind of, because if you just reread it, then that would be a total, then you'd be like, oh, it'd be more of like an academic exercise, right? Cause you're thinking, oh, I'm reading this and this is what the theme is. But when it's just coming from like a long ago memory, then it's like really what your gut remembers about this story, right? So that's awesome. Um, oh, good, we have some stuff in the chat. So Johnny Appleseed, Paul Bunyan. Yeah, all those really great old John Henry folk tales, to create a larger than life sort of mythological beings. And I, I to under the growth and development of a nation. And Paul Bunyan is, is so much about that, right? Um, and Johnny Appleseed too, of, of the, the westward expansion and Paul Bunyan being about the, you know, the logging industry and cutting down trees and like growth. Um, and John Henry was about the industrial revolution. Those American, our American, we're so young as a country, our, our American folk tales. Of course, we have Native American folk tales that, have, that are so old and rich and, and beautiful, but our new, the colony of American um, folk tales, it's a lot about expansion and growth and like, you know, the, what's the one that I just blank, blank he's a steamboat, 
guy too. And they're all these really big men. Like <laughs> John Henry was born with a hammer in his hand. And, and what does that say about like our American culture and what are these ideals of expansion and growth and this new little young country having these big dreams. That's really interesting. Um, Cinderella, yeah, treating everyone equally and not better than anyone else, right? Um, and again, that story, if you think about different people who would read or see Cinderella or hear it, they're gonna hear a different story because some of them might be a young girl who sees herself in Cinderella, but some of them might be a stepsister or a, a, a wife with stepchildren and they see that story differently, right? Um, and that's what's really worth exploring as we now do the next interesting piece, this process that, that I've done with these father-daughter scary stories. And that's of pairing your personal narratives with one of these folk and fairy tales. So, we have this this theme, right? With these stories, and maybe we look at um, three little pigs, and maybe that's a story about hard work, right? Um, or maybe it's a story about family taking care of each other, right? Because little pig, little brother, lazy with straw, runs to st the brother who was slightly less lazy with the stick house, and then they all end up running to the brother with the brick house. And maybe we always think of it as like, okay, yeah, hard work pays off. But what if we looked at the three little pigs as a story about family, okay? Um, and family just takes care of each other. So this next step, what I'd like you to think about doing um, in this next little bit, and then we'll wrap up, and um, is look at your list of what you've kind of created, the stories that you looked at, the themes, and I'll share that my screen again in a moment so you can refresh your memory. And then I want you to take some time and think about next to the stories that you wrote that have the theme. So let's say you had Jack and the Beanstalk, no free lunch. Next to that on your piece of paper or on your phone or on your computer, wherever you jot notes down, what story in your life has a similar sort of theme? Or your grandma's life or grandpa's life or aunt, uncle, cousin, anybody in your immediate circle, what has a similar kind of theme, right? So for instance, if I were to look at Three Little Pigs, and that theme of family just takes care of each other, then what comes to my mind right now is the fact that my father, who really didn't make very good choices as a father um, and left our family and we've been estranged for a while, I have now moved him from North Carolina to Montana to live right by me in an assisted living facility because of his dementia and it was unsafe for him to be alone. And that, was not a really easy, quick, simple decision for me because it's complicated, but families take care of each other. And that was something I felt strongly to do. And so I would be interested to look at that story paired with the three little pigs, um, which is a silly children's story, but what is it saying? Okay, so what I'd like you to do, I'm gonna share this screen again. And so take a look um, and just jot down some thoughts. I'll be quiet here um, and let you jot down some thoughts as you look at um, the themes of these stories and where is a, where do you see this theme? And you don't, you're not gonna be sharing these with us or this is just a private little exercise, but what stories in your life or in your immediate circles lie of your family's lives might have a similar theme to one of the themes of these stories. So I'll be quiet for a couple of minutes and let you sort of explore that um, with this list.
Okay. So I hope that that, that woke up some interesting thoughts as you looked at these folk tales and maybe thought, hmm, this is something that's happened. So now what I'm going to kind of walk you through the process of, of what I do with that. So this is a big way that I generate stories. Um, and this is kind of my process. And so I thought I would just share with you a quick glimpse as we wrap up um, of what I do with them. So this is actually my notes. I, <laughs> I wrote this down just because right before I perform, I like to jot my notes out again, re rewrite the outline of the story to make sure I hit those transition points. So I thought I would just show it to you as scrambled as it might seem to you. It won't make any sense, but, but if this is a writing project that you might be interested in doing, then this would be your next step. So every story has some things in common. They all have beginnings, they all have middles, and they all have ends. And somewhere in there, they have a problem. Okay, um, if you ever heard a two or three year old tell you about their day and talk for a very long time and you start to lose consciousness or any thread of what they're talking about, then you know what a story without a problem sounds like because it just goes on and on and on. But every good story has a problem. Okay, and so what I do is I outline my two stories next to each other on pieces of paper. So I'll have the folk tale and I'll just do bullet points of, of what happens in the beginning, what's the problem, kind of this, I'll summarize the outline. And then on the other side of the paper, I'll write down the personal narrative that I'm pairing with it. Okay, and then in this outlining process, um, actually I'm working on a new one. I wonder if I have it right here um, because I'm pairing, oh yeah, it's right here. This is my brainstorming sheet for a new one I'm working on for next week for um, Whitefish High School. So um, I just, I sort of do an arrow down, outline, arrow down. And then my next step is when I start to merge them. So I decide, okay, what do I want to come first? Um, do I want to open with the folktale or open with my personal story? I generally like to open with the folktale first, but that's just my preference. And then I look for moments and beats where I can hook them together. Um, where I can find key phrases to, for instance, with the, this folk tale that I, the pairing tonight, um, the farmer says, it's a deal. And then I go to my, me and my friend, and my friend says, it's a deal. And then I go back um, to the farmers, the table, um, and the blacksmith was, was um, had a plan. And then it's me, I had a plan, and then I was on my way, and then the blacksmith was on his way, and then Mary was on her way. And then, so I try to um, find common phrases that you can connect together, right? Like Lego blocks that are connecting the pieces of the story so that the, the ping pong effect doesn't make, doesn't feel like you're on a rocking boat, but it feels like kind of a natural sway between the stories. Um, and this, story that I performed tonight, it's very much back and forth and back and forth. But other pairings I've done is like I've told the bulk of the folk tale and then I tell the bulk of my story and then I thread back a little bit to the folk tale and a little bit to the to my story. And and so it's much bigger chunks. And just different stories work for different reasons. For this one, because it was like a scary suspenseful story, I wanted the suspense to like build until the end they were like on top of each other these two stories so if this is a creative project that you're interested in doing um, that's kind of what I do so I outline one on the left and one on the right and then on the, I start again and I kind of look for those key anchor points and I just draw arrows and then this and then this and then this <laughs> um, and sometimes I write out my stories fully and sometimes it never goes beyond that and I just have to practice telling them over and over to myself in the car, in the shower, whatever, until those come together. So um, before I kind of share my closing thoughts, I wanted to ask in, there's a Q&A box or um, Carmen or Rana, if you guys have any questions, you can shout them out. Does anyone have any questions about storytelling, about this process, about anything that has to do with the stories or or anything about the storytelling 
world or anything tonight? Any questions for me before we kind of wrap up and say good night? Does anyone have any questions? You can type them or say them. This is Carmen again. Hey, uh, Carmen. Did you, I, you might have said that, but I don't remember if you did or not. Um, what made you start with storytelling and how long have you uh, been doing it? Oh, yeah. So I started storytelling. My son is, well, probably really storytelling for a long time, right? We're all storytellers. But when my son, who's 16 um, now, when he was two or three, he had just this voracious appetite for stories. And so he would give me three animals and a problem. Um, so, you know, a turkey, a dolphin, and a whale, and a toothache. And then I had to create, I would just create a story. And he just wanted nonstop stories, which is funny because now he like never wants to watch me perform. <laughs> but in the beginning, he was like, how this all got going. Um, and then I just kind of grew from there. I was a theater major in college, um, but it was really hard to find ways to perform with three kids. And I was pretty careful about my content. And so I kind of had this idea in my mind of like, oh, I can like act out a story all by myself, like act at, do it all alone. Um, so I had this idea and I started doing it like daycares and preschools. And I came up with, um, you know, this Miss Mo moniker and stuff. And then I discovered that there's like a lot of people out in the world that are already doing this called storytelling. And that kind of launched me into this probably about four or five years that I've actually been storytelling and going to festivals and like have really discovered the world of storytelling. So I've, you know, been telling stories for a long time, but about four or five years where I've really been, I've had a YouTube channel and I've been going and performing and, and building and, and Corona has had many terrible things about it. But one positive thing is it's really helped me connect with a lot more audiences. So that's kind of the beginnings and, and how long it's been going. If that answers. Yeah. That. Great. Thank you. Oh, so David asks, what role does humor play in storytelling? I think it's huge. This story that I just shared is kind of heavy, but, um, but and there are some maybe humor moments. And there are some storytellers, if you're looking for funny storytellers, there's a storyteller out there. His name is Bill Lepp, L-E-P-P. -P, and he, um, he only does funny stories. And his goal is the gift of storytelling for him is just to give people an escape um, and heaven knows we need escapes right now right so I think humor I think humor can also be instructive but sometimes you just need a funny story because it's funny right I performed at a storytelling concert a few weeks ago where I did this tall tale about hypnotizing my son and accidentally like I hypnotized him tried to get him to stay asleep and then it became this tall tale of when he fell asleep and collapsed at the zoo because I had hypnotized him with this pet unicorn, pet zebra, and he saw a real zebra. And so he dropped and it was no instruction, no insight. It was just funny. And I think um, humor builds connection to people like laughing with somebody. It doesn't matter who you voted for, or what side you were on, or when you're laughing together, then like everybody feels more human. So there are a lot of storytellers that just focus on humor. I'm kind of a mix when I'm performing live, you know, I like to kind of warm up with some humor, but sometimes my stories have more of a depth, but um, I always like to have some kind of humor in there because I think it is a really important part of storytelling. Thanks, David. Great question. Any other questions? So this is Brianna here. I just wanted hey, to ask you, do you have a favorite story to perform? Oh, that really depends on who I'm in front of. <laughs> so, um, you know, if I'm performing to kindergartners or the like, I love Wide Mouth Frog. That's a really fun story um, to perform. Uh, it, that was really tough because it, it, it really depends on the audience. Um, I, th I think I would have to say my favorite stories are the ones that I, I feel really connected to. So I've told some folk tales and fairy tales, things that are like I just needed because I, I had, I was a librarian and so I needed to tell a new story. And so I learned one, but you know, stories that feel very real to me. Um, 
or stories that made me laugh in the process. I loved telling that zebra hypnos hypnosis story. It was my first attempt at a tall tale and I had a blast. That was like the most fun I had writing a story for a while because I'd never tried a tall tale before. And it was so fun to write and to create that story because you could go anywhere with it. So that's a really um, sound like a politician not answering the question at all. <laughs> <laughs> that you just threw out there because I just can't. It's like asking for who's my favorite child. It depends on the day, all right? <laughs> it depends on the audience. But I guess generally the ones that um, that just meant a lot to me in the writing and that I felt like really snapped with me while I was writing it. So sure, I don't know. Sure. It's pretty that big. Was actually going to be my next question. Do you ever write out a full script or do you write more of an outline and points that you go through? I have tried writing out. So the storyteller that I mentioned earlier named Bill Lepp, I met him once at a festival and I asked him about his writing process and he writes it out word for word. He's a very scripted storyteller. Like everything is very scripted. Um, and so he writes it all out in pen and then types it and stuff. And so after that, I tried doing that, but um I just, it's such an organic process for me. Um, I outline it and then I just kind of have to like say it because I found that when I try to write it out, it gets very long and it also, it's hard for me to then transition into it feeling kind of natural because I always want my storytelling to feel very um, purposeful. Like, you know, I, I sculpt, I, I craft the story. So I have those, those phrases that are very specific but I want it to feel like I'm just talking and telling a story. And so it's somewhere in the middle. So I will outline, um, I'll, I'll do an outline and there are then sp some specific phrases, but mostly it's, I outline it, I punch out some things that I that have to be in there. And then I just tell it over and over. Now I did write a rap it was a, some, a teacher asked me to do a story about the American Revolutionary War. And I was on this big Hamilton kick. And so I wrote a rap story about the revolution and then the writing of our national anthem. Um, and that one I had to write out obviously and memorize and it had to be word for word. But in general, I try to keep it very, kind of very fluid and open as long as I hit some key plot points or transitions that have to be in the right place at the right time for the story to work. Um, so kind of a mix is what I do there. Um, David asks, do storytellers, I don't know if everybody can see these. So um, if storytellers have styles of storytelling and how would I describe mine? Definitely. There's, there, are de there are people that do folk and fairy tales. There are people that do just humor. There are people that do touchy feely, um, personal narratives, um, people that, you know, focus on Native American tales. And yeah, they're definitely different ones. And it's, I really encourage you to explore the world of storytellers. Um, you know, look up the National Storytelling, International Storytelling Center is in Jonesboro, Tennessee. Um, and their, that website has links to lots of storytellers. And there's just so many different storytellers. But for my style, I really, I feel like my style is all about connection. That's why I tell stories. And so that's, if a story connects with me, then I tell it. And that can be a real story. It can be a tall tale. It could be a folk tale. But my style of storytelling is I want to bring people together with stories. And, and so that doesn't mean I have any specific style. Sometimes I really like for it to be about the laugh. Sometimes I really want to just dig in, but I want to bring people closer to each other and closer to themselves, like really looking at themselves. Just, it's all about connection to me. It's all about connection. And, um, and so my style is kind of all over the place, but I do hope that my style is genuine. Like that would be a word that I would hope people would describe about me. Like when they describe me as a storyteller, 
a word I would love to be used about myself <laughs> would be genuine. Like I would love for people to be like, I met her off stage. I met her, I saw her perform, I met her off stage, and those were the exact same people. <laughs> um, that she is telling a story that matters to her and she's genuine. So I guess if I were to describe my style, hopefully anyway, it would be um, it would be genuine. I would hope. I look at storytelling as I work really hard to craft a story. But after that, once I per start performing, I turn it over to the audience. The story doesn't belong to me anymore. I'm, I'm giving it to the audience and it stops being about me. And I'm just trying to, to give it, which is harder to do when I'm giving it to this little screen instead of like actual people. But I hope that I can always be a genuine storyteller or working in that direction. Thanks, David. That was a really good question and good for me to think about, to think about an answer for that question. So thanks. Any other questions before we wrap up? All righty. Well, um, thank you so much for being here. And I just going, I wanted to just kind of wrap up with some final thoughts about, about storytelling. Um, I went to a workshop once in Florida and there was a storyteller there and she puts on this these really cool events where she brings in people and they share stories from their lives and they do hours of interviews and then they take those interviews and they have professional writers take that down and create a 10 minute story. And then they have professional actors portray that story and they'll put on a concert. And, and it's become very powerful experiences for these people that are watching someone perform their story but she said something that has really stuck with me. And she said, when you hear someone's story, it's very difficult to hate them. And I felt like that is why I believe storytelling is so important because every human has layers of stories. They have layers of stories that inform the clothes that they are wearing, the food that they eat, the people they vote for, the things they're afraid of, um, the way they learn, the books they read, the books they won't read, the music they listen to, all of it. Every choice we have is backed up by a story, by something that happened. And when we see humans as these layers of stories of good choices, of bad choices, um, and can see that as a complete package, then it's so difficult to hate them. We can disagree with them. We can protect ourselves from them. We can hold them accountable for their decisions. <laughs> um, but perhaps it's harder to hate them when we see the layers of their stories. And that, um, that to me is why I tell stories and, and why I love this process of looking at folk and fairy tales and then looking at our stories and just sort of examining how they fit together. It's an interesting creative project, but I think it's also an interesting sort of emotional project um, to see how those fit together and how we can connect to each other. And so I wanted to close with one last quick story. There was a little old lady who lived on a little hill on the outside of a little village. And she was a little odd looking, didn't have a lot of teeth and wore old rags but she loved the people of this village. And so she would go down into this village and she would wanna to talk to them and, and visit them, but they rejected her. The children would run and hide behind their mothers. The women would cross the street to avoid talking to her. And the men would simply look up in the sky or look down in the ground, anything to avoid seeing her. And day after day, she would visit and day after day, she would be rejected. Well, one day a stranger rode into town and he was impressive. He wore all black except for this red feather in his hat. And he rode this enormous black stallion. And he was wearing this sweeping cape. And he rode into the town and everyone just swarmed. And the women swooned and the men puffed up their chests to try to look like him. And the children were all fighting over who would take care of the horse and who would polish his boots. And he was invited into every house for breakfast, lunch, dinner, whatever he wanted. And the little lady watched the town just bask in this man's glory. 
and she wondered why they loved him. Well, after a couple of days, he went for a ride on the outskirts of the town and he was riding past her home. So she ran out and she threw open her fence and she jumped in front of the horse and waved her arm, stop, stop, stop. Like pulled up his horse and he said, what do you want? What are you doing? And she said, who are you? Who are you and why do they love you? And he looked down at her and he said, well, first of all, who are you? And she looked at him and she said, I am truth. And none of them want me. And he sighed and he got off of his horse and he picked her up lightly in his arms and he put her on the saddle. And then he jumped onto the saddle and he wrapped her in his cape. And he said, friend, I am story. And from now on, we ride together. And so it is that still today, wherever story goes, truth is there, tucked under his cape. Thank you so, so much for tonight and for coming and participating. I really appreciate it. Thank you guys so much. And thank you so much for all of your wonderful stories tonight. I hope everybody watching and listening had a wonderful evening. And thank you again. Round of applause. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, David. Thank you. Thanks for, thanks for coming. Um, and if you know, I'll just say if, if, if you're from Bozeman, great. If you are not from Bozeman and you happen to be checking this out, please, um, if you'd like to bring I'd love to get to lots of communities and share this message of story. So contact me. I think, I imagine you guys will share my website. Um, you can find me at Mo Reynolds and then um, or on Facebook and, and we can connect with Humanities Montana and I'd love to spread these stories more. So <laughs> thank you so much, Carmen, for reaching out so we can make this happen. Thank you. This is great. Awesome. Thanks, you guys. Have a great night. Bye. All right. Bye. Bye.